Plato's dialogues are his writings. Platonism was originally expressed in the dialogues of Plato, in which the figure of Socrates is used to explain certain doctrines. The definition of Platonism is the intellectual consequence of denying the reality of the material world. Sensible objects, such as things we can touch, are only imperfect copies of the forms. The idea of Platonism is more thoroughly described in Plato's middle works about the forms. In these middle works, he clearly defines the distinction between that which is perceptible but not intelligible and that which is intelligible but imperceptible. Plato's works are the only to survive in totality of the ancient Greek philosophers. This is in part due to the school of learning that he founded, known as the Academy. His works and ways of thought were preserved there for centuries. The dialogues were written in the 50 years following Socrates' death in 399 BC. They were written about the past, using Socrates as the main character. In Plato's dialogues, he uses historical events to date the time period that he is talking about. Plato's works are officially, aren't officially dated, but scholars have defined three main periods, early, middle, and late, for his ideas. Plato's early works include books such as Crito, Protagoras, and Euthyphil. Since Socrates was Plato's idol, he creates a character that thinks, acts, and looks like his old teacher as a way to show his superiority. As a result of this, Plato often dis displays Socrates thinking and conversing with people at specific historical times in a way that is reflective of the time he is portrayed in. An example of this is in Plato's book Euthyphil, where Socrates poses as an ignorant student hoping to learn from a supposed expert, but in fact, he is teaching the expert that they are the truly ignorant by using the Socratic method. The Socratic method is a way for Socrates to lead the expert through their own reasoning, to present and analyze their own arguments, see their faults for themselves, and there by letting them sort things out for themselves. The purpose of this is to show that intelligence is subjective because some people may look really intelligent about what their field of study is, but when asked about things with deeper meanings, they are actually quite ignorant. Plato's main goal is to show us that comes when we are able to justify and account for our true belief, meaning that in order to be intelligent, one must not simply be able to memorize or repeat a lot of facts, but rather it is about being able to understand the meaning of those facts. Plato's works are written in a certain way known as Socratic or Platonic dialogues. The four elements of the dialogues are the plot or movement of the conversation, the agents in their moral aspect, the reasoning of the agenda, and their style or diction. Plato's Middle Works The dialogues considered to be a part of Plato's Middle Works are the well-known Republic and Symposium, as well as the Phaedo, Cratylus, and Phaedrus. In these works, some of the major Platonic ideas are introduced. One of Plato's most well-known ideas is his forms. According to David Rucknick, it is in the Phaedo that the forms are first introduced. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy tells us that these forms are goodness, beauty, equality, likeness, unity, being, sameness, difference, change, and changelessness. These forms make the highest and most perfect realm of being. Many of Plato's ideas are built upon the forms. This brings us to another major idea of Plato's. According to Peter Weigel, Plato believed that there was a physical and spiritual world that were separate from each other. As the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says, Plato believed the physical world we see is full of defects and that only the purest form of the spiritual world, for example, heaven, is the true reality. D.C. Schindler points out another, another significant idea in the Republic. He says that Plato thought of learning as a kind of recollection. So, in Plato's view, to understand a question, we must already have an idea of what the answer is. Plato also viewed learning as an upward journey to the ultimate reality. This ties in with Plato's view of wisdom. According to Rucknuck, Plato described wisdom as thinking only about things that are everlasting and changeless. In other words, focusing solely on the forms. 
Rocknuck also says that Plato believed the only way to reach the forms was through reason. Reason, as stated in the Republic, as well as rationality, is human nature. One way Plato described learning and wisdom was his allegory of the cave. According to Cohen, the allegory of the cave describes a situation in which prisoners are chained to a cave wall and all they can see is the opposite wall. When shadows are cast upon the wall, the prisoners believe that they are seeing real objects, but in reality, they are only seeing shadows of objects. To quote directly from Conan, the prisoners may learn what a book is by their experience with shadows of books, but they would be mistaken if they thought that the word book refers to something that any of them has ever seen. Likewise, we may acquire concepts by our perceptual experience of physical objects, but we would be mistaken if we thought that the concepts that we grasp were on the same level as the things that we perceive. One of the last major ideas of the middle works is the nature of goodness. According to Schindler, the Republic states that there are three manifestations of goodness. The first is goodness chosen for the sake of goodness and not for the sake of its results. The second is goodness for its own sake and for the sake of its results. The last is goodness chosen only for its results. These manifestations make up the nature of goodness, which Plato believed to be the foundation of truth, the cause of all existence of all things, and the goal of all human nature. In this section we have Plato's late works. They were written from 355 to 347 BC. Some of his works during this time include the Sophist, the Statesman, the Philebus, the Cratius, and the Laws. In Book One of Laws, Plato covers many different topics, such as, but not limited to, the divine origin of laws and how people react to war and different choices. Craton and Spartan laws were said to have been created by Zeus and Apollo themselves. Plato conveys his thoughts about divine origin in this quote through dialogue with Selenius and Majulus. Selenius says that where he is from, Zeus created legislation, whereas Majulus says Apollo created their legislation. This shows that Plato's theory of divine origin is apparent in his Book of Laws. Good and Evil, an apparent theme in Plato's Book of Laws. A good example is of Cleinias trying to convince the stranger of a concept of endless chaos. He says this by stating that every city is at war with every other city. In this state of chaos, armies can only exist when one's welfare is threatened. The Athenian stranger continues to go into more detail with an example of an individual family. The example is, is that if a family has four brothers and three are bad, then there must be one good brother and he is considered the minority. There's also three options that Plato suggests <coughs> to solve this problem. These pictures relate to the individual family by showing the three bad brothers, as you can see from the right and the bottom, and the one good brother in the left upper corner. One of the first choices that Plato suggests is that you could kill the bad brothers and let the good brother live in rule. The second choice is, is that you could let the good brother govern and make the bad brother serve against their will. The third example is, is that you could cre create a set of rules or laws to where you don't have to kill anybody at all so that everyone can live in peace. Which is the best option? Plato thought the third option was the best choice. He thought so because nobody died and nobody was enslaved. Now, let me ask you, what was your choice? I hope it was the third one, because otherwise you're kind of violent. Another one of Plato's important works towards the end of his life was the Tamias. This set up Plato's thoughts of how the universe was created out of the following four elements. Fire, wind, earth, and water. It gave a basis for most of the modern sciences today, and even though this concept was discarded in later years, what he said and how he thought about 
it was very interesting. An example that has all four elements in it is wood. Fire, because you can burn the wood. And as you burn the wood, you get ash and smoke. This is earth and wind, respectively. And as you burn the wood, you hear that sizzling sound. That's water. Plato links cosmology to his text Tamius by saying that the cosmos were birthed from elemental chaos, such as earth, wind, water, and fire. He also claims that time is a celestial movement and that it is an important way of keeping track of time. It is also characterized by temporal predicates. For example, this is because it is modeled on an eternal being. He also believes that the sphere is important because of its perfect shape and what it represents. The History of Plato Plato was born in Athens, Greece. His birth name was Aristocles. His nickname, Plato, which means broad, was given to him because he was broad in stature. He became a student of Socrates and adopted his style. He grew up hoping to be in politics like his father. He served in the military from 409 to 404 BC. He was prompted to leave in 403 BC because of the violence of the group. Socrates' death profoundly impacted Plato. He decided that politics wasn't for him and began to write extensively. He traveled to Greece, Italy, and even parts of Egypt for the next 12 years. While he was traveling, he studied the philosophy of his contemporaries and began to think about humanity's place in the universe. When he moved back to Athens in 387 BC, he opened the school for learning. It became known as the Academy. Plato ran the school until his death in 347 BC. Plato developed many ideas about the Academy, especially about the immortality of the soul and the afterlife. The Academy kept going after his death, but was destroyed in 86 BC during a siege of Athens. It was revived in 410 AD by some Neoplatonists and lasted until 529 AD.